Hi, everybody. Welcome to Miller Shop Talk Live Aluminum Series. Tonight, we're going to be talking about advanced aluminum MIG welding. My name is Chris Rail. I'm the product manager for the Miller Medic products at Miller Electric. I've been at Miller for 35 years, and for the last 17 years, I have been the product manager for the Miller Medic products. Uh, over those years, I have visited many aluminum uh, trailer, boat, container, customers. Uh, when I visited them, we talked with them, we identified their application, we recommended equipment, we recommended processes uh, to make them more productive and more profitable. So tonight we're looking to share that information with you. Along with me, uh, we also have two other members of the team, uh, one in front of the camera, one behind the camera. Uh, so you can see Cody Welch is also with us. Cody, if you could introduce yourself. Good evening, everybody. My name is Cody Welch. I'm a welding engineer for Miller Electric. Uh, my experience in the industry, I've been in the welding industry now for close to 27 years, give or take a little bit. Um, about the last 17 years of that has been as a welding engineer for Miller Electric. Um, I started my career working in welding shops, um, coming in as a young, a young kid, sweeping floors, grinding, cleanup work. Um, worked as certified welders. I've been a CWI um, welding engineer. Um, I'm also involved in the AWS uh, technical activities, the welding codes as well. I'm the vice chair of AWS D1 TG2. You guys will know that out there as D1.1 Clause 6, which is welder qualification, welder performance qualification, and welder procedure qualification. I'm also a member of AWS D1.2 Structural Aluminum, a voting member in that subcommittee as well. Very good. All right. Thanks, Cody. Also, uh, other member of the team is James. He's behind the scenes uh, running the cameras and uh, monitoring the chat. James, if you could introduce yourself and talk a little bit more about uh, tonight and uh, how we're going to be doing our session. Yeah. Um, so my name is James Veltheis. Um I'm kind of your connection from the chat to the guys on camera tonight. Um, so I'll be answering questions in the chat. I'll be bringing those questions forward to the guys on stream. Um, so if you do have any questions specifically about um, big welding aluminum, pulse, mel pulse welding aluminum, um, or you know just general questions about welding, uh, feel free to ask those in the chat. Um, I'll either ask, answer them in the chat or I'll bring them up to the guys on stream. Um, I'll also be posting some links in the chat as we go to our page to um, for the old streams or the past streams that we've done. Um, the guys here will probably reference those uh, every now and then to point out things that we might not necessarily touch on tonight, but that we've touched on in the past. Um, right. Chris, back to you. All right, real good. So, yeah, tonight, like I said, we're going to be talking about advanced aluminum MIG welding. Uh, so this is the second part of the MIG series. Uh, back in February, we did a basic MIG welding uh, uh, live stream where we talked about uh, aluminum. We talked about techniques. We talked about the different guns. Uh, we're not really going to be going into that uh, depth on those products or those topics tonight. Uh, but if you would want to, like James said, you can go back into the series and monitor those or watch those episodes to learn more about that. Or however, if you do still have some questions, put them in the chat. And if time permits, we can, you know, we'll be answering all any types of questions, uh, you know, regarding aluminum uh, and the process that we're doing. So, uh, so to kick things off, uh, like I said before, you know, Cody and I have gone to a lot of uh, locations looking at these aluminum applications and giving them giving them recommendations. So. You know, a lot of people say, what's the best system for my application? But before we can really tell them which application or system is best, what we need to do is understand what they're welding. Are they welding only aluminum or are they welding aluminum and steel or stainless steels? Uh, because of that, uh, we need to determine what kind of wire delivery system is best for them. If you're welding aluminum only, uh, you're going to be using a machine or a theater with a torque motor in it. If you're going to be using uh, aluminum and steel or stainless or other uh, wires where you're going to be using conventional MIG, you're going to want a constant speed wire feed delivery system. So, Cody, if you could maybe talk a little bit, what's the difference between a torque sure. system and a constant speed system? So, in our image here on the left-hand side, we have what's called an aluma feed system. Um, that aluma feed system can, is comprised of a power supply as well as the feeder up there. And that feeder is up there in a, in a, in a heavy-duty black case up there. Within that feeder is what we call a torque motor. 
Um, and that torque motor is just that. It pushes at a given torque. It does not push at a speed. Um, we have we have the torque motor in the in the, the case of the feeder. Then we have the the pull motor feeder and the push pull gun up in the front end, a pro gun or, or whatever kind of push pull gun you got on there. There's what we call the pull motor up in there. And what's going to happen is that torque motor just acts as an assist where that front motor in the Aluma Pro or Aluma Pro Plus, or not Aluma Pro Plus, but the Aluma Pro or um, your pistol gun, whatever you got there, really is doing most of the work. And that torque motor is just supplying wire to help float it down that liner. Um, when, when, we're, when we're dealing with aluminum, and, and you guys know this, and we've talked about this in other, in other um, Shop Talk Lives, is the feedability of aluminum is very critical. And so we, we don't want to be pulling on that wire into tension. We don't want to be crumpling it into compression. So what's going to happen is that that torque motor is just going to help flow that wire down there and just keep it floating down the liner while the front motor pulls the wire out. So those systems are typically going to be going into where we have dedicated type aluminum applications. So, you know, guys, that this is all we do. We're an aluminum shop. We're building aluminum boats, right. aluminum trailers, whatever it is. Um, we're, we're aluminum only guys. We don't have a need for anything other than that. That's where we're going to usually push those those kinds of systems into. We also have another customer base out there where, you know, maybe job shops or maybe shops where they're running multi-material, what we call multi-material uh, subsegment. And those might be places that are running, you know, stainless steel as well as, as, well as you know, aluminum and, and different materials on their feeder. They need more flexibility out of it. And what you have on the right-hand side is a push, a push system called an MPA plus feeder. Um, that MPA plus feeder is a constant drive system on there. What that means is it's going to operate just like most feeders we're familiar with. I'm going to set a wire speed there, and those rear drive motors are going to push that wire speed. Now, this presents some challenges because you've got two motors in that system. You've got a, a big motor in the back with multiple drive rolls on it. Four, that's a four drive roll system. Then you've got a smaller gun motor in the front. And you've got different rates that these motors accelerate and decelerate and do things like that. And so these motors really have to be working um, in sync with each other. What will happen is if, say for instance, we have that back motor on the feeder pushing wire really fast and that front motor maybe is running slow. And so we got more wire coming in than we have going out. What we're gonna start seeing is we're gonna start seeing the wire start to compress. and It's gonna start to wave in that line. You're gonna start seeing feed problems out of it. You know, if we go on the opposite end of the scenario, Maybe that, maybe that front motor is running fast and the rear motor now is running slow, you're going to start pulling that wire into tension and that's going to cause shaving, especially on our 5,000 wires, our 5,000 series, 53, 56, for example. That's actually going to start causing shaving on that wire when it goes around the, the bends and the guns and things like that. So we don't want to have that wire in much compression or tension. So what we do on that system is we have tachometers in the, in the back of the feeder at that big motor in the feeder. We also actually have a tachometer in the gun as well. And those two tacks are talking to each other so that, that feeder knows where it's at so that they, they don't keep the wire from getting into too much tension or too much compression. So an important thing to note out there, guys, when, when you're looking at these systems, if you've got an Aluma Pro Plus feeder, excuse me, an MPA Plus feeder, you want an Aluma Pro Plus gun. So that gun has got a tack so it can talk to that feeder. When we're on the, when we're on the torque, torque motor, we don't need that tack because we just got the torque motor floating the wire down the liner to us, and we can run it, you know, w without having to communicate between the two. And uh, another advantage of a torque motor over, uh, you know, the constant speed motor is if you're welding along and they actually do uh, pin a contact tip, what will happen is with a torque motor, the torque motor will stall out and you will not get like a bird's nest in the drive assembly back in the wire feeder. Where on a constant speed motor, uh, you know, if you pin a tip out at the gun, that motor inside the feeder is still going to try feeding that wire, and there's a chance that you could get some bird's nesting back right. into the drive rolls. Correct. All right. Correct. All right. So now that we understand the two different types of systems, uh, how do you determine what size amperage power supply is best for your application? That, that's another common question we get is, is you know, what, what size should I be buying? Do I need a 350 amp machine? Do I need a right. 250 amp machine? Do I need a 450 amp machine? What, what, what should I be buying for what I'm welding? And really, when we to answer that question, we, we got to really take into account how thick are we welding on, right? So the thicker we're getting on material, the more amperage capacity we have to have in that machine. And so, you know, on our 350 amp machine, um, that machine is three, rated at 350 amps, 60% uh, duty cycle on a three-phase power line coming in. That means that I can keep welding, you know, six out of 10 minutes 
under th at 350 amps on that machine. And on our MPA series, our XMT MPA series, we have wires. It's capable of running wires from 035, um, actually even to 116. So 035, 364, 116th, your most common sizes. It'll run up to that 116th wire. It'll put out power to burn that wire. Um, where, where we start having more discussions about when guys need to step up in the amperage class, where that 450 amp machine starts coming in is, you know, if if I'm talking to somebody and he's on thicker plate and, you know, he's saying, well, I want to, I need to run 1 16th wires. I'm up, I'm up, you know, 350 amps or higher all the time. I'm running high duty cycles. And so, so everybody understands when we're talking duty cycle, what we're talking about is how many minutes out of every 10 minute am I welding? So if I'm on a 60, a 60% duty cycle, that means I'm welding six out of 10 minutes. Doesn't mean I can weld 60% of the day. It means six out of every 10 minutes, I can have arc time. Machine needs to cool for four minutes. Um, our XMT 450, it runs 100% duty cycle at 450 amps. So if I've got, you know, big welds, I'm on thick material, I'm running 1 16th wires, I'm spraying that in there, pulsing it in there, real high parameters, trying to get fusion. And I'm doing, you know, maybe long runs, maybe I'm on, on, uh, automated systems, hard automated systems like that, where I'm going to be pushing those duty cycles. I'm probably going to recommend somebody step up into that 450 amp machine range. One thing to note, when we start getting up into those kinds of ranges with, with these machines, we also need to start probably considering whether or not uh, water cool guns is something that we need to bring into this equation now too, because when we're really pushing those kinds of high amperages, um, typically, I believe our, I think our Aluma Pro water cools, I think they're rated 100% duty cycle at 400 amps. You're going to need that to help keep from burning your guns up. And so that's something we'll see out there sometimes too, is guys, guys trying to run too hot on too small of guns out there and they'll burn their guns up over time. So uh, again, when, when we're starting to get into those big duty cycles, you need to stop and decide, you know, think about, do I need to go water cooled or not water cooled? All right, real good. Now you're talking about different wire diameters, Cody. You know, usually a one sixteenth wire. You know, is a certain amperage that you're welding at. Is there something you have to take into consideration to get that wire started? You know, will the three hundred fifty amp machine have enough power to get that yeah. started, or is that uh, something you need to think about going up to a four hundred amp machine? Yeah, on, on our, our three hundred fifty amp wires or machines, it'll it'll start those wires okay. down there. I mean, we got we got the programs built into there. Um, when, when, when we're starting to get, you know, high wire speeds, big power, though, you really want to have machines to make sure they've got the right, the right starting currents programmed into them. So we're going to talk about this a little bit more tonight. When, when we're talking about pulsing in machines, we have data built into the machines to get those wires to burn based off the wire diameter, um, the, wire, wire, the wire feed speeds that are being ran at, as well as the gas blends that are being ran. We're taking all those things into account when we're building these arcs, with the, when the weld engineers at Miller build our arcs. Um, start conditions, that's one of them. You know, how much, how many amps do we got to have when that wire hits the plate to clear that short and get us into an arc condition? Very good. All right. Good stuff. So now we know what kind of system we have. Now, how do we go about determining what's the best welding process for the application that we're going to be using? So again, that's really going to come down to our material thickness. Our, our material thickness is going to govern a lot of things and it's going to help guide our decision making process. Um, if, if, if we're running a, what we'd call a conventional CV machine, so a machine that's not capable of pulsing, it's our, our standard CV machine, like, like, the old, like the old CV transformer machines, things of that nature, where you don't have pulse capability, um, you're going to be stuck with what we call a transfer modes. And you're going to have a short circuit, a globular, and a spray transfer out of that. And the way those are achieved, and I believe we talked about some of this in, in the beginning series, but you know, a short circuit transfer, that's where we're going to be running kind of lower voltage, lower amperage. Um, that's not going to have a lot of heat in it. Short circuit really is for thinner type materials. When we bring short circuit into aluminum, it brings in a whole other dimension of, of you know, potential issues in that aluminum freezes a puddle very quickly. It doesn't, it's not driving down through there. It's not welding like steel. So materials that you could get away, you know, like steel, you get away a short circuit. Aluminum's not going to be so forgiving on it. And what you'll find is you'll have problems with bead fluidity, weld toe tie-in, penetration into the weld. But you're also, because that weld puddle's solidifying so quickly, you have the potential to trap hydrogen in there, which is our porosity. It, the, pri the hydrogen doesn't have time to outgas out of the puddle. The puddle essentially just freezes right over and it traps it in there. So short circuit, unless you're on something that's really thin enough to be able to outgas in time and be fluid, is, is not a recommended process typically. 
Um, mm -hmm. When we go to globular transfer, that's going to be, again, just on a CV machine. We're going to bring the voltage and the wire feed speed, amperage, up. But it's going to get to a point where it's, it's not short-circuiting anymore. The wire's up off the puddle, but you're seeing big balls form on the tip. If, you, if you're seeing big balls on the tip of the wire, big formulation of, you know, right off that wire tip, you'll see a ball form on it, big glob, and then it'll, it'll flop across there. That means you're in globular transfer. And the problems we have with globular transfer is that when, when, you have, when you have that kind of transfer going on, you have that ball coming across the arc and it's making a big splash in that puddle and it's blowing spatter out. It's washing that puddle out. It's not tying it in. It's washing it where it can cold lap over the material. And so you have chances for lack of fusion at the weld toes, defects, things like that. So globular transfer, again, is not really one that we recommend for any kind of material. Um, Sometimes people have to run it though because the material thickness they're welding in, that's that's the only transfer they can get to because when they move up to spray now, spray they're gonna turn the voltage and the wire feed speed even higher and that puddle now is gonna get hot and those droplets on there, they're gonna get smaller. They're not gonna be large balls forming. They're gonna be small droplets that are streaming across that arc, which is nice on aluminum and, and we like welding aluminum with that because now we're going to have a lot of drive. We're going to have a lot of penetration. We're going to have bead fluidity for the for the weld to wash out for us. It's going to solidify a little slower so that we have time for the the, the hydrogen to outgas and the porosity to come out. We're going to get cleaner welds. But you're, you're kind of limited with some things there because now now you're welding hot. So what do you, what do you do when you're on those material thicknesses that that don't you know, that, that short circuit's too cold for, right. but spraying's too hot for. You're burning through on spray and you're cold lapping on short circuit. And so guys will try running in the globular region there because that's kind of all they've got. Um, in comes pulsing. And one of the benefits we're going to have with pulsing, and we're going we're to talk about this a lot tonight, is that we can now run that whole wire feed speed range. Because with the nature of pulse, we're going to, and we've got high speed video here we're going to be showing you. With pulsing, we've got one droplet that's coming across that arc at a time. And one of the values of that is, is we, as the weld engineers here, when we build these arcs, when we're putting in the data, and we're going to talk about what that data is and what it does, um, we build that so that it can happen through the entire wire feed speed range. So th there is no globular transfer region anymore. There's no short circuit transfer region anymore. So if I need to get down to a lower wire speed and cooler welding conditions, but still keep a nice clean arc transfer, so I'm not getting spatter coming out, I'm not getting, you know, I'm not getting lack of fusion at my toes. I'm getting the chance for the puddle to outgas. Um, that's going to help me help my productivity. It's going to help my welders out there. Number, you know, that's a big right. thing is my, my welders out there, their skill, it's going to be more forgiving for them so they can make better quality beads out in production. Right. Another advantage of pulse welding is, um, like you said, you can weld thick gauge material down to thinner gauge materials, right? Uh, usually in the past, when people tried welding thinner gauge material, they'd want to go down to a smaller diameter wire like an 030 or an 035. Uh, but the nice thing with pulse welding is you can actually weld thinner gauge material with larger diameter wires. And the benefit for that is just, again, the feedability of aluminum. I mean, trying to push aluminum through a 25-foot push-pull uh, push gun, you know, that that's, you know, it, it's better with a push-pull gun. But still, if you can use a larger diameter wire, that's going to, also lend itself better to having a, a productive weld and a good quality weld. Stack the odds in your favor. Yep. Right, exactly. Yep. Uh, and then the other th advantages of pulse welding over spray is positions. Uh, typically a spray transfer is good in a flat or a horizontal position, but now with the pulse MIG capabilities, you can actually weld flat, horizontal, vertical, and overhead. So again, it gives you more flexibility because of the pulse uh, feature and you know Cody's going to be talking about that right, in a little yep. bit more detail. We'll, we'll talk some more about that. The right. what when, when we're running when we're running pulse at a given wire feed speed, we compare it to CV spray. Um, generally speaking, you're going to have a lower average voltage and a little bit lower average current. And that's going to allow a little bit lower a little bit more puddle control, a little cooler puddle, a little easier for your operator to carry out of position. Mm -hmm. Going to let that puddle stack and solidify in the joint before gravity has a chance to pull it out. Right. Okay. Can we? Why don't we just uh, talk a little bit more about pulse and some of the the controls that you have there? There we sure. go. So you heard me talk about what we're when pulsing, we're we're moving the current on that, and that's exactly what we're doing. We we pulse the current up and down, and so what we have right here is we have this blue line you see is is a just kind of a generic what we call a waveform, and that would be the current, the, the actual welding current coming out of the machine going to the wire, and what you have there is is letter A. That's the peak current. 
And these are all parameters that at the factory we program into the machines based on, again, the wire diameter that's being ran, um, the gas blend affects this, and the wire feed speeds affect this. And so at each wire feed speed setting that where we build these at, we have A, there, that's our peak current. What that is is, is that's where the ball is going to build up the most current so that ball can transfer across the yard and get that clean, detach, pinch, what we call pinch effect, pinch off that wire and propel it across the arc. Once we come out of that, we're going to drop down to what you see the letter B. That's called the background phase. And the background phase, that's where the current's going to drop down to some value, whatever it needs to be, and no, no wire is going to transfer across the arc at this time. Unlike spray, where you just kind of consistently got droplets coming across, there's nothing's going to come across. And that puddle's just going to cool a little bit. And then you're going to ramp back up to the next peak. With that, we have C, which is called pulse width. And pulse width is going to help drive. Um, one of the things our pulse width is going to affect is, is our, our ball detachment, our droplet detachment off, off there. But also, it's going to kind of affect our cone shape. One thing to note on here is, is, is the variables that get entered in for these, what variables the well engineer goes with on these when they build these arcs, have an effect on how that arc cone kind of looks. We can kind of shape our arc cones a little bit by doing different things with, with this parameter data. We're going to talk about what some of that is in the machine and how you can do that yourself in the machine. Right. And then letter D right there, that's our frequency. And that's how many, basically how many times in a second that we hit those peak currents and essentially how many, how many balls per second, how many droplets per second fire across that arc. And depending on where that wire feed speed is at, it might be from you know, 30 per second to several hundred per second. So it just it depends on, on the kind of power level we got to have to get that wire to, to be at appropriate burn rate. Right, real good. So, uh, you know, another thing about the pulse welding, because like Cody said, this is happening 50 to 300 times a second, depending on your wire feed speed and wire type. Uh, the power supply that is needed for this is is a, what they call a, is an inverter power supply, because that has the capability of switching back and forth, you know, the controlling the arc at that speed. Uh, a conventional transformer-based machine, uh, like the uh, Delta Weld or a Millimatic 252 or some of the CP machines that Miller has had over the years, those machines are just standard transformer-based machines and they don't have that capability. So if you're going to be welding aluminum with those kind of power supplies, uh, your options are, are typically a spray transfer. But to go to a pulse MIG machine, you're going to have to move to an inverter power supply that has that control and the speed to switch that uh, output of the welding arc. But you'll get increased flexibility with what your machine can handle. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. So very good. All right. So we talked about uh, wire feeders. We talked about power supplies. We talked about the different processes. Uh, James, if we can go to you, do you have any questions in the chat that maybe uh, uh, you can? Let us yeah. Know about? Um, we've got a question here on the two eleven. Actually, um, he's asking: Is his two eleven capable, or does it have the power to spray? Yes, the 211, you know, that has the capability of 120 or 120 volts or 240. Uh, but with the machine on that machine, with a with the spool gun and the wire feed speeds, yes, that machine will bear, break into a spray transfer uh, on that 211 uh, for aluminum. Now, if you're going to be welding steel or stainless steel, it doesn't have the power to do that. But with the uh, uh, the aluminum capabilities, that machine will break into a spray transfer. And then we've also got some questions that were asked in previous live streams that uh, we didn't get to in those streams. Okay. And one of those is on um, profile pulse or double pulse. Um, can you talk a little bit about that maybe? Sure. Yep. I can talk about profile pulse here. So Miller has what's called profile pulse. Um, what we're doing with profile pulse is, is this wave that you see in front of you right now. Um, that wave shape is still running. When, when guys out there, you ones out there that you guys have ran pulsing, people have had experience with it, You'll, you know that audible buzz in that arc, that buzz sound, you, you've heard it. That's that frequency in there, that, that letter D. Um, what we're doing when we're running profile pulses, we're still running that. that that's still going on as, as the well. That's how the droplets are pinching and coming across, just, just like we talked about, that's still happening. What we also bring in that now is we bring in a wire feed speed change. And what happens is, and you can set what that is in the feeder. The Aluma feed system we have over here has it. Um, but what happens is you can set how much wire you want it to bring in and out of the arc, meaning that if, if I set it to a, a change of 30%, it's going to add in 30% over my preset 
and drop 30% under my preset. So let's say 100 IPM is what I have set on the front of my machine. It's going to be pulsing. It's pulsing along just like what we talked about. Wire speed is actually going to increase. And as that wire speed increases, so does that pulse data we just talked about. It's going to match what it needs to be so it burns off good. And it's going to put you know a larger, larger puddle there. And then it's going to drop back to 70. It's going to go 30% below. And that's going to be cooler. And that's what's going to let that puddle kind of settle. It's, it's still welding. But it's going to let it's not going to be as fluid, and so you'll you'll get that ripple effect from the wire speed and the power going up and down, up and down, up and down on it. What other advantages are there for the profile pulse? Does it help with thinner gauge material, even less heat input into the part? You know, what are some of the applications yeah, well, that people are using that for? One one of the best things with profile pulse, where it really was intended to go for go towards, is is for cosmetics. So, um, people that are welding, you know, expensive boats, expensive horse trailers, welds that typically have been done in the industry by experienced TIG guys. Um, TIG, TIG has this place that's very useful. Um, it's used extensively throughout the aluminum industry. Um, but when, when we're getting into examples is like outside corner joints, I can take profile pulse on my wire gun, on my, on my Luma Pro Plus, and I can run a ripple looking bead across that joint. I should have brought one of those with me here tonight, but anyway, I can run a ripple looking bead across that joint and that bead will look very similar to a, a TIG bead. So people don't want to have that, cos that cosmetic look to it, but I can do it, number one, with, with the same, same machine I'm running for the fillet welds and all the rest of the production on my part. Um, and I can also do it at faster travel speeds, get more productivity out of my equipment as well. So, gotcha. so it's, it's the ripple effect. So in using profile pulse, you basically are just drawing a line with your gun. You're just starting from the left and going to the right if you're yep. uh, right-handed. Uh, but otherwise, if people don't have profile pulse, then what people will do is just sort of like do a, a stop and pause technique, or you know, I don't really want to say a whip technique, but they'll go and stop, go and stop, go and stop. And that, that uh, rhythm uh, will also give you that, you know, a beat appearance, but you have to be careful doing that because if you make your um, gap too much, you could actually, you know, uh, weaken the weld and have, you know, some, you know, issues with the surface of your weld. So that's something you'd have to be careful with. That, that's a great point, Chris. You know, when when we look at, so let's let's use again, for example, an outside corner weld, um, you know, 10 gauge material, let's say, you want a nice cosmetic look. Old technology, you'd have somebody trying to spray that it's going to be hard that joint's not going to be able to take yeah, it. you're going to be trying right. to burn through you're going to try to short circuit it it's not going to have fluidity and then on top of that you're trying to get this whip bead into there to try to get the ripples on there and it's not that it can't be done because there's guys out there do it but it's difficult it's going to be very difficult technique for people right. to pick up and learn in comes profile pulse where now we have pulsing on there we can have a lot better control of our heat we can set the wire speed where we need it and every time we hit that high wire feed speed pulse we just move ahead on the puddle and let the next one ha happen. Just hit it, hit it, hit it, hit it, and just keep stepping down on the front edge of that puddle every time. Any any other uh, questions, James? Yeah, we've got a guy with an Envision 354 MP. Is there a technique to account for the lack of hot start and crater fill? The, the hot start and crater fill, the Envision 354 MP, there's a blast from the past. <laughs> um, the hot start and crater fill, those really are features that are present on the feeders. Um, the feeders is typically going to control what that's going to be. So on, on the Aluma feed system we have here and those, those, the MPA plus, we have the hot start buttons on there. So if you don't have that, a couple techniques that guys will use is, you know, is on the starts, they'll start, they'll kind of whip back to wash that puddle and try to push it out a little bit, try to get it to blend in and then come forward. Um, on the crater side, a lot of times, and, and, I, and the code book, I believe, even allows this, a lot of times I'll see guys break the arc and they'll just re-trigger and tack over that, right. or they'll try to wash back in there. Ideally, you really probably ought to be using a crater in there. Um, a crate, when I say crater, I mean a, a, a crater arc end on there so that that puddle, that puddle never solidifies and forms a, a center line crack in it. Guys out there, you've seen it. 5356 is more prone to it than 4043. When when you break that arc, you've got that crater. Sometimes you'll see that little crack in there. If you're using the crater function on a machine, that's going to allow that puddle to solidify a little slower so that it doesn't, and it's going to allow that wire to kind of keep feeding in there and build that up so it's got some strength in there. So when it tries to, when it finally cools, that tension in the weld metal don't cause it to pull apart and crack. I've even been to a customer who has, uh, 
I've never seen it before. They obviously have a lot more coordination than I do. But what they'll actually do is when they start, they have their hand on the wire feed speed control on the push pull gun. And what they'll do is they'll start out with a higher wire feed speed to get it more heat into the part. And then they manually ramp it down to, you know, their, their actual wire feed speed. So, yeah, a lot more coordination than I have. But uh, there's uh, other people out there doing that uh, technique as well. Right. That, that's a great question. If, if, if hot starts and crater functionality is important to you, invest in the, the feeders that, that have that kind of capability. Right. Yep. All right. Anything else, James? I think we're good for now. All right. Real good. So now we talked about pulse. Uh, Cody, are there any other controls that we can use now to dial in or optimize your uh, your welds? Right. So yeah, there are. There, there's several controls on there. We're gonna we're gonna talk about some of them. Um, we have arc length, arc control, and, and synergic. Uh, what what we have up in front of you right here is a high speed video. This is this is what pulse looks like. So when when we talked about pulse before, you you heard me say the peak amps. And what you're seeing is you're seeing those balls droplets come across and you see that big flash as that droplet comes across. Those are the peak amps I'm talking about. Every time one of those is happening, that's based on our frequency. Again, that could be from you know, 30, 40 to maybe several hundred times per second, depending on the wire feed speed, depending on the weld program, a number of different factors. Um, when, that, when that arc kind of goes dim, that's when we're in the background. You don't see any wire coming across the arc at that point. That allows that puddle to slightly solidify in that joint, kind of cool down, so we can control the puddle better on there. And again, that's going to also help drop our average voltage and average heat, or excuse me, our average voltage and average amperage down a little bit. When we move forward into some of the control we have on there, we have what's called arc length, which is going to be just that. We have arc length, arc control, and wire feed speed. And we're going to talk about what those are now. Um, so our arc length on there, I'm going to move over to our machine here so you can see. Our arc length on this Aluma feed is right here at the top, this 50 number. And what that is, that 50 really is just an arbitrary value. It, it's not 50 volts. Um, it's, it's just a number that Miller has assigned to what this is a nominal setting. So out of the box, 50 is usually where you want to start setting your equipment up. So what I'll tell people is, you know, they want to, well, where, where do I need to be? I'll say, set your wire feed speed to where you're used to. Set that arc length at 50. Next question I'll get is, well, what does the arc length do? Well, the arc length is going to do exactly what it says. It's going to move the arc length up or it's going to move it down. So as I bring that 50 number, I dial that 50 number up, that arc is going to increase. And you can see that happening on the screen there. You see the, the high arc. That's when we took that arc length. I think it was up around like maybe 60 on the arc length. If I take that arc length and I dial it down, then it's going to shorten that arc length up. It's going to bring that arc closer to the puddle. So this really allows you to essentially dial in where, where an operator likes to run that arc. So if you like it at 50, fantastic, run it at 50. If you, if you get it out of the box and you think, oh, 50 is a little, maybe a little longer than I like, dial it down. You really don't have to go far, typically. If you're, if you're in a, well, a good, you know, good setup, good proper weld cable sizes, distances, et cetera, um, the right gas shielding that we built the programs on. You really don't have to make big swings typically on that. Um, so you just drop it down a few points to wherever you like it. If you know, and then the opposite. If 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 you if you want a little bit more arc length, we'll talk about some reasons why maybe you want more arc length. But if you want a little more arc length, just dial that number up again to wherever the operator is comfortable with. There's not really a right or wrong number that it has to be at. Um, it's really where where you need it to make the welds. More of personal preference, yeah. You know, like I said, we started out at 50, and a lot of times what I'll, starting out with people to where you want to be is, you know, we started out so that the wire's like low, driving into the puddle. Then you start increasing that arc length, just so that way the wire's coming out of the puddle. You hear a little crackle in the arc every once in a while. And typically that's right where I like to leave it, because now you're having a real good uh, arc length. You have no spatter. And also, it's going to help with your travel speeds. You're going to let you move at a, at a higher rate uh, versus if you have a too high of an arc length, like the picture on the left-hand side. Now, what happens is you sort of have to, you're not going to have spatter, uh, obviously, but uh, what you're also going to probably do is slow your travel speed down a little bit. So, you know, those, you know, it's like I said, depending on your application, 
the joint configuration, and even the shielding gas you're using, you know, uh, that can also affect those kind of things. Or the joint prep, you know, another thing that I've seen in the past, if you're doing an outside corner where you, there's no backing, where you don't want to have a lot of penetration, usually welding with a higher arc length will make the wire a little softer, a little bit wider, and help float that puddle flow, you know, on your outside corner. Right. And so some, some of the times I get asked, you know, by, by guys too is, is you know, what, when would I need to turn it up? Why, you know, or when would I need to turn it down? And, and Chris just talked about a number of, number of those things. If I, I might turn it down, if I want to get that arc a little closer to the puddle, a little bit smaller bead, faster fill on my travel speed. So I can, you know, so I can go a little quicker. I don't have to wait on the puddle to flow out. Mm -hmm. um, typically more often than not, I see people have to increase it. And we're going to, we're going to get into more discussion on why that is here, but it has to do a lot of times with what we call voltage drop. And that's, that's basically resistance in your weld cables. So we're, we're going to a lot of times increase that to get that arc up off the puddle. So if you guys set your arc up and you're at 50 and you're seeing spatter coming out of that arc, you know, it's harsh, there's a lot of crackle, you got spatter flying off, that's a sign, number one, of either you've got the wrong program called up, you've got the wrong gas on there, or you've got voltage drop in your leads. And we're going to talk about what causes of that can be. Um, so what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to raise that arc length up to get that up off the puddle so your wire's not smashing into that puddle and, and sending right. spatter out on your parts all over the place. Right. All right. So you mentioned arc control. We talked about that. Another variable, variable we have is, uh, excuse me, we talked about arc length. Other variable we have is arc control. Right. Can you talk a little bit more about that? One, one other thing before we talk about arc control I want to mention before okay. us all forget about it is uh, sometimes when we change our gases too, when we change gases with arc length, um, aluminum, a lot of times we're on 100% argon, um, but sometimes if we start bringing in different uh, helium blends, that helium takes more power to get it to ionize and get it into a plasma state. So you, you might have to increase your, your arc length. Now, our machines have programs for 75 helium, 25 argon built into them for that very reason. However, there's lots of different helium blends out there. So, you know, let's say you're on a, a 75 argon, 25 helium, um, you might want to bring that arc length up just a little bit more to help get that additional helium to ionize across the arc. So gas blends can affect it as well. Um, our arc control here, no, the arc control. This is one that I hear a lot about. Um, <laughs> this is this is the black magic knob or black magic button, depending on which machine we're talking about. Um, I've heard lots of explanations about you know from guys about what what it does, and and some of them are some of them are pretty close, some of them are right, some some of them are not quite so right. <laughs> Um, but it, it seems to have a lot of mystery around it, and and really there there isn't much mystery. It's really a pretty simple control. Um, on our machine, on an MPA system, this blue button here, when we push this blue button, it's gonna light this up. It says arc control, and it says sharp twenty five. Sh on an MPA, we call this control sharp arc. Sometimes you'll hear it referred on an MPA again. One thing I want to I want to emphasize with the audience out there is I am talking about um, Miller XMT MPAs, Envision MPAs, Aluma Power MPAs, um, any machine that is called an MPA. Um, this will also apply. What the things we're talking about are going to apply to 350P as well. It will not apply to guys out there if you're running um, AccuPulse. Uh, if you got you know an an old access machine, if you got a continuum machine, if you've got a, one of the new Delta Weld platform machines, if you're running AccuPulse, what I'm describing here is is not the same. There's, it's doing it may try to do some similar things, but it's doing it completely different. The knobs are going different directions. So please do not try to interpret what I'm saying as a blanket statement for pulsing as a whole. This is specific to our MPA machines out there. So if you have an MPA machine, this is exactly how it's working. <clears throat> So the sharp arc, when we push that sharp arc button on there, it's going to take us over to this number. It says sharp 25 right there. And I can adjust it on this dial up or down. And it goes 25 up to 50 and 25 down to zero. Okay. And what this knob really is, is it's the way I describe this knob is an arc characteristic control. So earlier in the presentation, you heard me talk about um, our waveform, the peak amps, the background amps, the pulse width, how we can change some of these to affect a change in the arc condition, the arc characteristic. Um, on your screen right there, you see two different arcs. That arc on the left-hand side is running about a setting of, of 45. 
This is with a 4943 wire, a Hobart 4943 aluminum wire. It's running about a setting of about 45 on the arc control, okay? And what you'll see is you see that arc, when, it, when those pulses come through, it flashes, the droplet comes across, but you also see that arc really kind of constrict. It doesn't, it doesn't stay out as wide as the one on the low side. So our arc that we're seeing on the low side video, that was ran out of a setting of about arc control of 10, okay? And you'll see that that arc spends a lot more time. Um, it, it stays wider. It doesn't constrict as much. But what's actually happening in this machine is we're shifting those variables that I just talked to you about. The peak amps, the background amps, the pulse widths, the frequencies. And so what will happen is if you guys have ever played with this, when you push that button and you take that knob up, you go from 25 to as high as you want to go, take it 25 to 45, 50, whatever, you're going to hear the frequency wind up. You're going to hear it get louder, that buzz get louder. What the machine is doing is it's increasing the frequency and the peak amperage. Those, are, those values are both now increasing. We're trying to keep the power balance because if we just let those, those variables go up, the, the wire will get too much power on it and the arc length will grow. So what we do is we pull down the pulse width and the background app. So those drop to kind of keep a power balance on the wire. And what that does is now we're, we're not spending as much time in the background. The pulse width value is lower, so we don't spend as much time in that wide of an arc cone. And so we have what, what, what you'll see by your eyes. You'll see that arc kind of stand up and kind of constrict in a little bit when you bring that arc up. And times when I might want to do that is if I want to have maybe a little more directional control over where my arc is going. Um, maybe if I want my bead a little bit more convex. Uh, maybe if I want to run a little faster bead, I don't want to have to wait on it to flow so much. I might tighten and stiffen that, bring that number up to stiffen that up a little bit. Or I might want more fluidity out of my bead. I might want a little bit flatter bead. I might want a little bit you know, flatter tie-ins at the weld toes. And if that's the case, what I'll do is I'll come down on that number. And as that number comes down, we're going to have the opposite effect out of that pulse data. Those peak amps and and frequencies that had increased are now going to go down while the pulse width and background amps now come up. So now it spends more time in the background time and with more pulse width there, and that's going to give it more arc cones. So what you're going to see there now, guys, is that arc, when you start getting that arc really low, you're going to start seeing a flutter show up on the edges of that arc cone, and that flutter is going to help push that puddle out and get a little bit more wetting out of it for you. That's what our arc control is doing. It's not major changes in the arc. This, these are fine-tuned controls for, you know, if, if I want to catch a little bit more of an edge joint, you know. Um, very, very subtle controls to control our bead profiles. It's our puddle profiles we're really kind of trying to control here. So that, that's what our arc control is doing. It's, it's not black magic. It's not, it's not complicated. We're just shifting some of the pulse data. The biggest thing that I, I want everybody out there to remember when we're talking with MPAs, is if I want a little bit more fluidity without really changing my, my arc characteristic. I like my arc height. I've got the heat I need. But I want just a little bit more fluidity in that bead. I'm going to come down with that number. I, again, if I got the, the, the wire speed I like, I can carry that puddle. But I want it to stiffen up, you know, set up a little quicker in the joint, a little more convexity. I might bring it up. It's, it's for dialing in preference. And there's no right or wrong with it. As long as you're not making scrap out there, you know, Go nuts. You know, it's really about what the operator wants to run to get the job done that he needs to get done. All right. All right. So no more black magic. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. So good deal. So now another thing when you talk about pulse welding, we always talk about synergic. Do you have any examples that could talk about what synergic means? Oh, yeah. So synergic, that's that's another one that 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 people get confused. And when we talk about synergic, they, they're trying to understand what we mean and what what we're talking about with Synergic is essentially one knob control of our welding heat. So when, when we're talking about MIG welding, our heat is controlled through wire feed speed. Amperage is really our heat, and that's controlled through the wire feed speed. So you know, on this, I've got a, I'm, I'm grabbing our gun here. Our gun's got a potentiometer on the back, so I'm, I'm using the gun right here to whoop, whoop. Using the gun, set that back. Using the gun right here to to move it. I don't know if you guys can see that very well or not, but I'm using the, the pot on the gun and I'm, I'm going to move that wire speed up or down. And what you're going to see is that puddle and that arc is going to change. And as that wire speed comes hot, goes up, that puddle is going to get hotter. And as you come down with it, the puddle is going to get a little cooler. Now, 
the benefit of Synergic is when we when we run Synergic, as that wire speed changes, the arc length does not change. So if you watched that video as it was going across the screen, that wire feed speed was going is going from the low end. I think we're like around 180 amps, and then we're we're gradually increasing it. So running that wire speed up, you can see that that arc length is not is not changing at all. It's staying there pretty pretty close. You can see right now that puddle's getting bigger, that crater's getting deeper, getting more fluid. The puddle's building up higher behind it. All I'm changing when I when we ran this video is I was just bringing the wire speed up. That's all it was. So what that means is as an operator, you know, on the old traditional CV equipment, I would have to go back and make a voltage change with the wire speed. Every time I made a wire speed change, I'd have to dial in a, a, a voltage to correspond with it. With synergic control, that's going to allow me to change through that wire feed speed range. Again, going back to this arc length number, if I liked that arc a little close, maybe tighter, it's going to stay a little tight through that whole wire feed speed range now. If I wanted that arc a little long, it's going to stay just a little long now through that whole wire feed speed range. I don't have to go back and make another adjustment. Right. And, you know, that was one of the calls that we would get somebody who is used to regular conventional MIG and switching over to Pulse. Uh, we get questions where, you know, I, as I increase my wire feed speed, now my arc length is real long and it's out of control. And what happens is they're, they forget about the synergic control. They're actually increasing their wire feed speed, but then they also increase their arc length. So again, it's very simple to use. Once you get that arc length dialed in to exactly where you like it, just change your wire feed speed to all your different material thicknesses. Right. And you can see that in the image right here. The, the image on the left, 180 amps. Um, compare that to the one on the right. The one on the right, you can see that crater's a little deeper. Um, the puddle's a little bigger. It's built up a little bit more behind it. That's the additional wire coming in. Um, again, all I did was just change wire feed speed on that. No other adjustments. That's synergic is all about simplicity. Simplicity, better ease of use in your operations, less chance for mistakes. Rework. Okay. okay. All right, we talked about some of these other controls we have for pulse welding. Uh, James, any other questions come in on the chat? Yeah, we've got a couple here. Um, can you run an Aluma feed on a Trailblazer? Yes, you can run an Aluma feed on a Trailblazer. Yep. If it's if it, if your machine is has a 14 pin, if it's a, it's a reasonably recent machine with a 14 pin, um, so like I believe like a Trailbla Trailblazer 302s will do it. I think the 305s will do it. Um, yeah, you should be able to run that on there. You won't have pulsing capability on there be able to run it in CV because that's the capability of the of the power supply the welder. Another question we've got is um, what would be a recommended transfer mode for eighth inch to three sixteen aluminum pulse? Yep. Pulsing on aluminum. I, I'm a big fan of pulse on aluminum. I don't like running it's so much easier. It's so much more flexible on that eighth inch, you know, depending on which wire alloy I run, we talked about some of that earlier about forty different wire feeds give an amperage um you know that an eighth inch is a really good example of aluminum that's it's kind of getting to the point where short circuit it's too cold and spring it's too hot pulsing fits into that perfectly right can you run an aluma feed on a bobcat uh, i don't think the bobcat has a fork no it does not no no you Another could question sorry yeah, go ahead. Hook the a power supply into the bobcat maybe with your feeder, but uh, as far as just hooking the feeder box into the bobcat, no. Another question here: um, Is there a converter to connect it to a dynasty? What's that? A converter to connect it to a dynasty, like the dynasty multiprocess? Oh, no, nope. Um. Do you have any recommendations? This is a question we got on a previous live stream. Do you have any recommendations for preparing aluminum pipe? For aluminum pipe. So that's a good one when we talk about our, our point design. No, that could be a good segue yeah, into that, right? Let's talk about our... Yep. Yeah, perfect. So perfect. aluminum pipe, and, and I knew this one would come up. Um, so typically when, when we're talking aluminum pipe, um, most aluminum pipe applications that I've been exposed to or talked to guys about usually are being done with a backer, with like a backing ring in there, um, some sort of type of backing. Now, when, when we're in, in conditions um, where we're in open root welds, especially if, if we're working to AWS D1.2, which is our structural aluminum code, um, it does not consider a open joint 
be done with MIG as a CJP or what we call complete joint penetration. Uh, it, it doesn't consider that as a CJP weld. So it would if you're doing TIG. You could TIG those in. It allows that for TIG and I believe plasma as well. Um, but MIG, we really don't want to be getting into open root joint type aspects. It's, it's very difficult to control that puddle and get it to melt evenly in, with proper reinforcement into, into both sides of our welding joint, into both walls there. Um, TIG, it can do it. I, I generally try to steer away from whenever whenever I can, whenever the joint allows me, the part allows me, I really try to steer away from doing the aluminum as a whole. Um, it can be done. You need a good TIG hand on it that can read that puddle and control the heat, correct the heat properly. Um, so also with our with our joint design, some of the, some of the differences here with between aluminum and steel, this is something I see out there quite a bit. Um, Guys will, they'll, they'll prep their joints like for aluminum the same way they're prepping it for steel. What I mean by that is they'll go with the same kind of joint geometries. So, you know, alum, or excuse me, on steel, it's not uncommon to have groove openings and include, with an included angle of 45 degrees or even less on a, on a root open, or excuse me, on an included angle. When we're running aluminum on MIG out there, we, we're, again, we control our heat through wire feed speed. We just talked about that. To get the, that heat up, there's so much heat sinking in aluminum. To get that heat up, we're running a lot of wire feeds. You have to have a place for that wire to go. And so you need to open up those joint angles. So it's not uncommon to start look, seeing joint angles when we're talking aluminum getting up to 60 degree openings or even 90 degree openings. Um, up on the screen right there, we got some examples of, of what would be done for aluminum joint openings, joint designs. Um, a couple things to be aware of. When we're starting to open those joint designs up now, that means that we're going to be putting a lot of passes in there. There's going to be a lot of heat, a lot of expansion and contraction going on in that material. So opportunity for warpage. So when you're getting into thick joint designs, you might want to start thinking about doing things like double bevel preps where you're prepping bevels on each side. Um, you want to think about uh, going with, with joint designs that are going to minimize the amount of, of bevel that you have to put in there but still allow the aluminum to weld, um, not you know something that's got enough opening that you're able to get fusion into the sidewalls, not something that's so vertical like a square butt that it's going to that it's going to miss the sidewalls. We can do the square butt with it, but we're kind of limited on the material thicknesses we can go with, as well as the gapping becomes very important. Um, another resource for, for for people out there is if if you want more ideas of what you can or can't use is the D1.2 aluminum structural code. Um, Annex B in here, it's got joint designs for open root. And you'll see that most of these joint designs are, I don't know if you can see that very well, are full pens with backers in them. Um, we'll call backers, backing bar, either a ceramic or, or a permanent backing. But this is another resource for what the angles are, what the lands need to be, what the root opening should be. Um, again, that does not guarantee that that weld is going to get fusion. There's a lot of variables that come to play with that. Um, Everything in the D1.2 code, you're, there's no pre-qualified, so the you know, weld procedures are all gone through. They go through testing with pencil pull bends, et cetera. Um, so just be aware of that. Just because it's in there does not guarantee that it's going to work in your application. So that's another really good resource for people out there as well. All right, Cody, earlier you talked about uh, voltage drop. Can you go into that a little bit more and how right. that affects your, your arc? So voltage drop is... Voltage drop is by far and away probably one of the most common complaints I see, I hear about, that we deal with. Um, what voltage drop is, is essentially it's resistance in our weld circuit. So when we're talking about our weld circuit, we have a positive lead that's going to our feeder, you know, in our gun. Then we have our negative work clamp, or you guys call it ground clamp. That's a whole current loop on there. And that, that electricity has to pass through that current loop. And whenever we do things to impede the progress of that electricity through that, it's going to cause resistance in there. And resistance is our enemy when we're welding. So in this picture you see up in that top left-hand corner, what that is is that's a, I guess, like a spring ground clamp that's been all arced up. Um, it's really useless. It's junk. What that is is, number one, it's all arced up because it probably wasn't connected to the table securely. And so what it resistance really is is it's resisting the flow of the current. And there's a number of places that it will show itself. Um, rotary grounds. When we, when we get into advanced manufacturing things, guys that are on tanks and vessels, rotary grounds are all over the place. And when I take a, when I take a call and I, know, and I know this guy's on tanks, one of the first questions I want to know is, are you on a rotary ground? Um, 
they're famous for it. So with the rotary grounds, you really need to make sure that your rotary grounds are being maintained. They're being greased with the proper grease um, so that that current can flow through that rotary ground and minimize the voltage drop in there. Uh, other really common ones are weld cable sizing. By far and away, weld cable is expensive. Nobody wants to, wants to have to spend any more money on weld cable than they have to. So what they do is they skimp on it. This is, this is a problem out there because when, you, when you, you're running too small that weld cable, these, especially with pulsing, this becomes an issue because we've got these big peak amps we talked about. We're, we got to get that, that amperage may have to get up to several hundred amps or maybe more depending on what we're trying to do, what size wire and, and other things. But you got to get that big burst of amperage down that, that cable. And when that cable is too small, it's going to choke it down. And so what's going to happen is by the time that, that wave gets down there, it's going to be so choked down that that pulse wave is going to get the top of it chopped off. That won't reach those peak amps that we're trying to get to to get that nice clean ball droplet to come across there. And so what guys will see is they'll see spatter in their arc. The arc's going to be tight and it's going to be pounding the puddle and the spatter's going everywhere. They call Miller and say, Miller, you know, my machine's welding bad, you know, and, and so then we start digging into what's going on. And, oh, they've got, you know, they're running number one cable or, or whatever on there. So um, when, when we're talking about our welding system, weld cable is expensive, but it, to me it's a buy once, cry once kind of deal. You know, if you, if you skimp on, on your weld cables, you're just going to make more problems for you down the road. You're going to have problems in your production. You're going to have problems with your rework. You're going to have problems with your spatter. And it's just, just set it yourself up for success at first. Get the right size cable. How big a cable is going to depend, number one, on, on the amperages that we're running. So the, the higher the amperages, the bigger the diameter of the cable, and also the lengths of the cable that we're running. The lengths become very important as well. So the longer the run, the bigger the cable has to be. And in our owner's manuals, you'll find tables in there that are kind of going to kind of tell you where they got to be. So when we do this and we're talking about pulse machines, it's going to say, you know, X size cable, 3 aught cable, whatever, for this many amps. Keep in mind those peak amps. You might be welling at 200 average amps, but you're still hitting those big peak amps. So take that into consideration when you're sizing your cable. Don't you know when we're pulsing? Don't just size it off the average amps. You gotta have you gotta have a little extra there for those peak amps to come. Very good. All right, we're kind of getting close to the end of our session here. But uh, is there any other common issues that uh, you see uh, for welding uh, that's impeding your aluminum performance? Yep. Another one is, is contact tips here. And what we have here is we actually have a cutaway of a contact tip. Um, th this is one the guy's a little bit more familiar with, but what, what I see people do out there is they try to rebore their contact tips. They try to drill them out. You know, they try to do whatever. Those contact tips are sized for a reason, and they're sized at a particular size on there, um, especially when we're talking about aluminum. And so what happens is as we're welding, that welding current gets to the wire. Those peak amps are, and Welding current is all getting the wire through that contact tip. And that contact tip is constantly rubbing, or that wire is constantly rubbing on that contact tip. And as, it, as that power transfers from the contact tip to the wire, sometimes that might get a little intermittent contact in there, and you might have actually what we call micro arcs inside there. And that's what you see, those little spots inside that contact tip called micro arcs. That's the erosion actually happening in your tip. And when we're dealing with aluminum, we have those micro arcs. You might deposit a little bit of, of aluminum in those micro arcs. Now you've got aluminum trying to feed on aluminum, and it, it's, it doesn't feed along itself well. It kind of galls in there. It's not going to feed smoothly. And so you'll start to feel that chatter in your gun. You'll start to see that arc now start to bounce up and down. You know, right. That's another sign. It could be other things. You could have line, you know, liner problems or whatever. But again, get the right contact tips. Use the properly sized contact tips. They matter. Because you got to get that wire or that power transferred to that wire clean. Right. Another thing regarding the contact tips, Cody mentioned, is uh, typically aluminum contact tip is a little oversized than a, a steel contact tip. So, for example, if you're using 035 aluminum wire, uh, don't use an 035 steel tip. You want to use an 035 aluminum tip, which is probably going to be around 039. Uh, again, for aluminum, you know, 364, so 047, you want to use the right contact tip. You don't want to use an 045 steel tip for that because you need a little bit more room in there for the, the aluminum transfer. Right. So and we stamp, yep. we stamp the, I believe we stamp the Bernard tips with, right. with aluminum yep. on there too, AL, right. so you know. It, right, it'll say 035 AL or 047 AL, so that way you know you have yourself 
you know, a, an aluminum tip over a standard right. steel tip. So, so real good. So yeah, as far as that, uh, James, um, any uh, questions from our chat? Yep, we've got a couple more questions here. Are there any benefits to running 047 over 035 other than feedability? Um, yeah, there is. One, one of which is flexibility. So with an 047, especially when we're talking pulse now, um, is the flexibility and, and the range of thicknesses I can weld my parts. So I, I can cover a bigger range that the pulsing is going to let me get down on, on material where I typically maybe had to run an 030 or an 035. It's going to let me get down in there because it's going to, again, it's going to reduce the average current voltages like we talked about at a given wire feed speed. Um, another, an, so another aspect of that too is, depending on what your operation is, now maybe I don't have to carry an inventory of different size wires. I can standardize on more kind of one, one size wire. I might not have to carry a fleet of wires I have to manage. With that too is, is sometimes wire diameters are actually a little cheaper to buy when they're bigger. So they don't have to go through the draw benches many times. When, when, they're, when they're making these wires, they're pulling them through draw benches. And if you're going with an 047 wire, that means it doesn't have to get pulled and drawn through so many times. So there's less working on the wire and a little bit less expensive. So, yep, I... I I, I run a lot of 047 yep. kind of whenever I can, and it, it just gives me a lot a lot of flexibility in what I'm going to do. I can weld, you know, quarter inch with it. That's another thing out there, guys, when we're talking advanced um, MIG welding. When we're selecting our wire sizes, make sure we're not just selecting, you know, if I run quarter inch steel with 035 wire, that's not the wire I would recommend you guys go with. I'd, I'd step up, go to an 047. So get a, bit, a little bit bigger wire if I'm going to go on that quarter inch. If, if I'm going on to you know, 3 8 thick, I might even move up to a 1 16th wire at that point. Right. So size your wires for aluminum, not for... All right, I think that's the only question that we still had left to answer. Um, got a couple of quick little housekeeping items here. Um, if you want to see some of the past live streams that we've done, um, I'll drop a link in the chat to our um, Chop Talk Live Aluminum Series playlist. Um, if you want to stay up to date on future Shop Talk Lives, we've actually got some uh, more advanced big aluminum Shop Talk Lives coming up in June on the 8th and the 15th, same time on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Central Time. Um, we do not have the sign-up page uh, ready for that yet, but um, I'll drop a link in the chat to where that page will be once it is live. Um, so if you guys do want to stay up to date and uh, take a look at those future Shop Talk Lives, you can go there. Um, if you have any questions we didn't answer today, you can email us at shoptalklive at millerwelds.com. I'll also drop that uh, link in the chat. And if you have any suggestions for future Shop Talk Live episodes, feel free to email those to us. Um, we do read those. and. Um, you know, we're, we're looking into what we can do to kind of expand this a little bit. Um, Chris, Cody, anything else from you guys? No, like I said, it's, uh, you know, it's always, uh, aluminum is becoming more and more popular in the industry, you know, as far as with transportation, with uh, fuel economy, things want to be strong, want to be light. So, you know, um, over the years, just like welding processes improved, also the the metals that you know people are using in welding every day is is changing. Also, and aluminum is becoming more and more popular. I just want to say thanks to everybody for taking their time to listen to me talk here. I hope everybody got something useful out of it. Um, you guys see me at Fabtech. Come up, talk to me. One day I come walking into your shop. Come up, let me shake your hand. I want to meet you guys out there. You know, we're all cut from the same cloth. We're in the welding industry, and we're what keeps this, this country turning. So keep burning blue, boys. Appreciate it, everybody. Have a good night. All right.